I've already made videos about using Adobe apps on the deck, as well as using it as a video production station, but a couple weeks ago, Sergio Sarmiento piqued my curiosity. If you can, I need a video on whether the deck can be used as a portable digital art workstation. This is probably a really niche use case though. Well, Serge, niche use cases happen to be my specialty. So come along for the ride as I try to convert this humble Steam Deck into a full-fledged digital drawing tablet. At first blush, this seemed like a no-brainer to me. The Steam Deck has a 7-inch touchscreen. Of course you can use it as a drawing tablet, right? Well, it's complicated. First off, not all touchscreens are created equal. Typically, a touchscreen uses what's called a digitizer, which is basically a piece of glass that converts your touch input to a tap or click on the device that you're using. Older touch devices like Palm Pilots had resistive touchscreens, which activated when a suitable amount of pressure was applied to the screen. These were phased out rather quickly, however, because they typically required the use of a pen or stylus in order to apply firm enough pressure to a specific area of the screen. A modern example would be a Nintendo DS. Nowadays, most touch devices use capacitive touchscreens, which rely on the passive electric field of your body to register a touch input. This is better for most people because it requires almost no force in order to use. In fact, on some especially sensitive devices, you can activate the touch input without even touching the device. But it also means it needs a much larger object in order to contact the screen of the device to use. Enter this, the touchscreen stylus. You've probably seen one or two of these handed out as swag at a job convention or school assembly. These work by using conductive materials on the soft tip to emulate the tip of a finger. Because capacitive touchscreens only use electric fields to detect inputs, you can actually use any conductive material for this. Here's something you can try at home. Find something made of metal like a key and gently rub it on your phone's screen while it's unlocked. Nothing will happen because the key isn't big enough to be detected by your phone's digitizer. Now take a penny and place it flat on your phone's screen and move it around with the key. This time, the penny is a large enough conductive surface that the digitizer recognizes the input. That's essentially how these stylus pens work. But what does all this have to do with the Steam Deck? Well, digitizers are a lot like the screens they're attached to. They have a refresh rate, known as a polling rate. The faster the digitizer polls, which is when it checks if there's an input, the smoother the experience, just like a higher refresh rate on a screen. The screen of the deck, however, yeah, that's not exactly encouraging. I can't get a proper measurement, but it seems to be about 30 hertz, which isn't even on par with the 60 hertz refresh rate of the screen. If you wanted to know where Valve cut corners on the deck, here's your first clue. Still, 30 hertz isn't nothing, we just need to temper our expectations. I did try using my grubby little human fingers, but the finger painting experience was rather lackluster. I knew I had to find a stylus if I was going to make this work. I began with one of those touchscreen styluses I showed earlier, but the fat tip and textured surface of my deck's glass just made it feel like I was drawing on sandpaper. But this did get me thinking. I had seen another device just like the Steam Deck used as a tablet. Colors Live for the Nintendo Switch had made use of this weird clear disc stylus hybrid to make drawing on that tablet actually enjoyable. Wolf Den has an excellent video explaining how that game made use of the Switch's control surfaces as well. That inspired me to buy this, the Adonit Pro 4. You can tell it's pro because it's rose gold. Note the comparison between our key and penny setup from earlier. The resemblance to our Colors Live stylus is striking, however, it doesn't have the aux cable connecting it to the deck, which means pressure sensitivity is out. And it was at this point that I almost gave up. The pen wouldn't work. There was just no way I could make it track on the screen, at least not consistently. I even took off my anti-glare coating to see if that was the issue, but no such luck. I was really ready to give up this whole project, but then... I had a stroke. Of genius, I mean. There isn't just one touch surface on the Steam Deck. There's actually three. With trepidation, I touched my fancy stylus to the trackpad and BAM! All of a sudden, we were cooking with fire. I did have a problem, though. Now that I had a viable drawing surface, how could I best take advantage of this tablet? 
What features should I include? I mean, I'm not exactly an expert on this stuff. I've owned a couple of drawing tablets before, but nothing fancy. I knew I had to do some more research before I could really tear into this project. So I interviewed two people who I knew could shed some light on what a drawing tablet should be able to do. My interviewees were Levi Din, a freelance artist and professional graphic designer, and Jonah Loeb, former character artist for Bethesda Game Studios, whose work you might be familiar with. First name Levi, um, I've been streaming for since 2017, so five years now. With digital art, I have been uh, kind of dabbling for 10 years, but seriously like delving in for around five years now. My name is Jonah. Um, I am uh, traditionally a uh, character artist for games like Skyrim and Fallout. And then I've recently transitioned over to being a concept artist and illustrator. Uh, and my, I'm coming out with a book on September 27th called Marvel Anatomy. And that's a book of, of Marvel superheroes and villains and their anatomy and physiology and biology. Before we get to the interviews though, a quick word about channel memberships. If you'd like to support this channel and the videos I make, you can become a channel member for just $1 per month. That will give you access to exclusive behind the scenes videos and photos, as well as other content like my stream archive and the unedited interviews for both Jonah and Levi. You can cancel a membership at any time. Anyway, on to the interviews. How much does size matter when it comes to either screens that you draw directly on or those separated drawing tablets? How much does the size of the drawing surface matter to you? It doesn't have to be huge, but it should be, it should be large enough so that you can operate it um, by kind of it, the key to drawing well and gracefully. Uh, and also the most healthy way is to draw from the shoulder and elbow as much as possible and not etching like, with your fingers. And so um, when it comes to drawing or painting, I need to be on a size screen that is at least as big as a, as a piece of paper. One, which is like probably a universal one, is like a large surface area or active area, um, just because it makes your workflow way more seamless and you don't have to like lift your hands as much, obviously. So size does matter then? Yeah, absolutely, yes. 1,000%. What programs have you used in the past? On the PC, I use Photoshop, mostly. Um, I will also use it for 3D, 3D apps as well, uh, like 3D Studio Max and, and ZBrush and Topo Gun. Uh, on the iPad, I prefer to use Procreate. Um, Photoshop on the iPad is is not up to snuff, unfortunately. I, I think the only one that I'm like truly comfortable with in terms of drawing pads is Illustrator or Illustrator, uh, what's it called? Illustrator Sketch or something. Mm -hmm. um, the one for mobile. I have grown with Illustrator so much to a point where I, I it's just like second nature at this point. So that's the one I'm for sure most comfortable with. Again, like you said, Procreate is something I've used before and I can see myself getting comfortable with it. I just haven't had any access to practice or mm. anything like that really. Have you experimented with uh, free options like GIMP? I used GIMP like a whole lot back in the day. Um, it's more so GIMP is like really weird because it's to me, it's like a blend of Photoshop and Illustrator. Um, and now that I've actually used like the, the actual Illustrator, I'm like, I definitely prefer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think GIMP's like an actual awesome option for people who don't want to like spend the money for sure or just don't have access. You know, I think GIMP is actually like really good. Mm -hmm. Are there any inputs or tools that you have seen or would like to see? When it comes to drawing software, no, I think that a, a program like Procreate is already pretty strong to me and it has almost everything I want uh, because I kind of think it's really important that I think I think there's something to be said for using tech to amplify and uh, expedite your um, creative process. But with that said, 95% of the creative process is just the drawing and the, or the painting. And so, um, and getting hemmed up in too many technological doohickeys, I think for me runs a bit counter to the idea of, of art, which is basically just to lose yourself in the process of creating. And so a program like Procreate, for instance, it's slim, it's lightweight, it really only has a limited number of functions. And I prefer that because it keeps things simple for me. Um, and so keeping things intuitive, keeping things simple and keeping things limited actually is a much more freeing experience for me. For sure, macro keys. Because at this point, what, if you like went on like Amazon or something and you were scrolling for like a separated tablet, there's not gonna be one that has less than four keys unless it's like really just like low down, down like far down you, you cannot, cannot find them very easily anymore so i think that's, that's like for sure something you need um 
it would, would be almost, almost like a disservice to your product, product if you made one without them because it's just it's, it's almost a, it's pretty much a standard at this point um active area size like i said before is huge but i think one that's like actively growing to become one of like the norm the standard is uh pressure sensitivity for like your pens i think that is huge it like allows you all the variation in the world that you need for like your brush strokes or anything like that where can people find your work um you can find me at youtube at www.youtube.com slash Jonah Loeb draws. And then on Twitter, you can, uh, on Twitter, you can find me at Jonah Loeb. Uh, that's my handle. Where, where can people find you on Twitter? I will be at, uh, Plummet sucks. P L U M E N T H S U X. And I, I stream pretty much anything that I find interesting. I stream a lot of fighting games mostly, but I've been expanding and kind of going back and expanding a lot. It, it kind of varies depending on the time. Armed with information, I set out to make the Steam Deck the best drawing tablet it could possibly be. First up was software. For all you who yelled at me for using Adobe products in my Windows 11 on the Steam Deck video, you can rejoice. I couldn't find any way to get Photoshop or Illustrator working on my deck. At least, not legitimately. Not even using Remote Play, which I thought would be pretty cool if it worked. No dice. So I went back to the title of the device, Steam. I looked through a couple of lists of art programs available on Steam, and the most promising seemed to be Black Ink. However, after installing the demo version, it just wouldn't even launch. No matter. What about Krita? It's shown up on a few lists I've seen, and it's only $15, which is half of what I pay for Adobe every month. But one of the reviews pointed me to the program's website, which offers it for free. Then, on a hunch, I looked it up in Flatpak, and yep, there it is. Krita is fully functional and free to use. And the best part is, once you install a program from Flatpak, adding it to Steam is super easy. Just right-click it in the Start menu. Now that I had a program to work with, I could really dig into the deck's control surface. First up was controlling the pen. The deck's touchpads work like both a capacitive and resistive touch surface, which means you can move the pen along the top of the surface to move the mouse, and then press in more firmly to draw. This required some tuning, but eventually I got the force to be about what you want from a pen on paper, if a little stiffer. Next was sensitivity. The deck features what it calls trigger dampening, which allows the triggers to be depressed in order to slow down the mouse when in trackball mode. I set the right trigger to act like a sort of reverse throttle for the mouse, where the more you pull the trigger, the more fine control you have over the stylus. This small change turned my initially disappointed, no, oh, into a pleasantly surprised, oh! Now I had some real room to work. With the mouse taken care of, I could make some buttons specific to functions available in Krita. The left paddles are undo, redo, the left thumbstick is set to move the entire canvas around, and the face buttons and the D-pad control the layers, and the right bumper brings up the brush slash color menu. Moving the mouse by lightly brushing it along the surface felt great, and pressing firmly to paint just feels right. Lastly, I bought a stand that I could use to adjust the angle of the deck, since I'm still jealous of the Switch OLED's awesome kickstand. I was really quite awestruck. The ease of use for something that otherwise looks like a toy was just fascinating, and you can't say that this would be possible on any other device simply because of how much hardware was crammed into this console. The level of customizability offered in the Steam controller menu is groundbreaking. I've made my controller mapping for this device public, by the way, so you can go check it out for yourself. The only problem is, of course, the size. Whether or not that's an issue for you largely depends on what kind of work you'll be doing. I used this configuration to make the thumbnail for this video, but I can obviously see that for larger or more intricate work, the size could get in the way. That's why I wanted to see if I could take this one step further with this, the XP Pen Deco Fun L. These go for around 50 bucks, but you can get them closer to 20 used or at a pawn shop. And this really was the last piece of the puzzle. With the deck propped up and able to use all of its buttons and macros, the larger drawing surface gave me unparalleled control over my cursor. And the best thing is, even without any drivers installed, this actually has pressure sensitivity. Krita worked with this drawing pad natively, though XP Pen also has full fat app images on their website as well. Wacom users aren't so lucky, unfortunately, though I don't have a Wacom tablet to test whether or not they'll work without drivers. 
This was easily the most work I've put into one of my videos, and I think it's really a great demonstration of just how versatile the deck is as a device. There's a lot more to be discovered by both users and Valve themselves, and I can't wait to see what new crazy uses can be found for this little gaming handheld. If you like this video, I have a bunch more that only focus on the deck, so make sure to check those out. Also, be sure to watch both Levi and Jonah's streams, and pre-order Jonah's new book, Marvel Anatomy. It's a literal dissection of pretty much every Marvel character you can think of. And like I said, I've uploaded the full, unedited interviews I had with both Levi and Jonah for our channel members. They're both super interesting people, and you should definitely check those interviews out if you can. So, it's the Steam Deck. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> there you go. This, see, this is just a, another one of your schemes for the it Steam is, Deck. It is another one of my schemes. But please, if you can guess, where do you think the pen uh, is used? Uh, do you use it on, like, the touchpads? You use it on the touchpads. <laughs> it just, it just, you know, I made both the Giants and the Mammoth. And, right. Um, and I, I wanted the player not just to want to run up and kill them. You know, I'm playing Elden Ring right now and you kill everything. There's like little like Galapagos <laughs> turtles and you need to kill them and get to get the, their meat. Um, and it just makes me feel bad, you know? And so I, I didn't want people, uh, you know, just randomly attacking and, you know, and killing all these majestic things. As always, I couldn't do this without you guys. So please like, share, and subscribe so I can make bigger and better content in the future. I'll see you next time. So we feed Pep in a little food bowl. But Cricket is sleeping right where we normally feed him. So witness this problem solving. <laughs> Cricket. Cricket, why are you doing this to him? <laughs>